So how's everyone today? How did you find your evening last night? Busy evening? For some of you I know it's a busy emotional evening. That's a good thing. And what we wanted to do a little bit today, Mary wanted to chat about something with you, which is what you've been just handed out. And uh, so I'll leave that up to Mary now. Hi, everyone. Hi, Mary. Um, I'm really nervous again. But, um, I just wanted to share this message with you because it's um, something that's really helped me a lot. Um, it's a message from the pageant messages, so some of you will have read it before. Um, but I was talking to AJ on the way over here about um, this whole journey for me and um, how difficult it still is sometimes to feel that the truth is emotional. Um, and I suppose especially because of my memories being very emotional and um, being very hard to intellectually understand at times. Um, yeah, that's, this message has helped me a lot with that. And in essence, the message talks about um, when you find a truth and experience a truth, um, which is, is an emotional process, to allow that to stay with you. I'm, I'm sure lots of you come to these days and hear AJ talk and feel inspired and feel the truth and feel this connection and feel like, wow, I've learned something. And then you go home and it's Wednesday and you're in the middle of your job. And you think, oh, did that really happen? Like, can that really be true? And that's happened to me. <laughs> and um, what John talks about in this message is allowing a truth to settle within you and really focusing on that truth and praying about that truth so that when the next truth hits you, you're actually building on a foundation of the truth within you. Um, rather than just we have all these experiences of truths coming at us and we, we respond to them and we feel about them, but if we let them go again or if we allow the intellect to, to take over and, um, in our day-to-day -day life, then it's almost like we're, we're having to go back through this whole process all over again. He says a few other things as well that I think are really beautiful and one of them is that um, Love is the basis for all spiritual um, knowledge and truths. And I thought that was really relevant for this weekend's conversation as well, because we're talking about development and love. And um, if we can develop that within ourselves, um, and we do that, I suppose, by this divine love process, praying for love from God and releasing these, these errors within us, then we have a really strong foundation for more truths to come into our life and to learn more truths. And I think that's really beautiful. And I think John says it much better than I just have, so that's why I gave you the, the, uh, the printout. I don't read it. I thought that I'd read it so that you so you get the idea of what he's talking about. He says, I desire to write a little tonight upon a subject that may prove to be of interest to you and others who may read my message. I will not write a very long message, but I will say what I desire in short sentences so that the truth that I intend to convey may be understood at a glance. Well, when you are sure that you have discovered or have revi had revealed to you a truth, let it sink deep into your soul so that it will find such lodgment as will cause you to realise that this truth is a reality and a thing that must not be forgotten or neglected in its application to your daily life on earth. When you have found that truth, found that the truth fits some peculiar condition of your mind's experience, adopt it as a criterion for determining what your course of action shall be. When you have thus adopted it, let it always remain with you as a guide and monitor in determining what your belief as to the particular thing involved shall be. When you have thus received this belief of the mind, encourage and feed upon it until it becomes a thing of established faith. And when faith has become a part of your very being, you will find that the accompaniments of such faith in the way of longings and aspirations 
will become things of real existences, which will result in actual knowledge. When such knowledge becomes yours, then you will have solved the problem of what is true and what is not. And when you have solved this, you will, will become a man who, when he utters this knowledge of truth, will speak as one having authority. Such was the process by which Jesus became the possessor and authentic expositor of the great spiritual truths that had never before been known and declared by any man. Of course, these various steps which lead to this great knowledge of truth must be taken gradually and with increased confidence. In all this, the help and influence of the Father are necessary, and such help and influence comes only in response to sincere, soul-aspiring prayer. Prayer must arise from the soul of the man, of man, and the response must come from God. There is no other means by which this knowledge can be obtained. All knowledge of things spiritual, that men may think they possess, coming in any other way, cannot be relied, relied on. For there is only one source of such knowledge, out of which the real spiritual truths of God emanate. And love is the great principle that enters into all knowledge of things spiritual. And without love, it is utterly impossible for man to rightfully conceive the truths of God and possess them. I merely desire to give you this short lesson on truth and knowledge and love, so that in receiving and absorbing our messages of the great spiritual truths of the Father, you may realize the means of making them your own in a manner to satisfy your soul perceptions. I will come soon and write you a message on some of these vital truths. <coughs> Think of what I have above written, and you will find that your soul perceptions will be opened up to a clear and wonderful comprehension of the real meaning of what we desire to reveal. I will not write more tonight, your brother in Christ, John. And I wanted to say a little about it too, if I could. Um, many of you are hearing these things that resonate with your souls. And many of you feel the resonation with yourself, don't you, quite, quite a lot. But, but the key in making it your own is actually now putting it into action. And actually letting the truth not only be absorbed into your mind, but as John said, develop from your mind the, the action upon these truths and start, and start basing your life around these truths. And when you start basing your life around the truths, you, what happens is you start getting proof from the, external, from the external that these truths are real. And once you start getting this proof, the proof enters your heart or enters your soul. And once that proof enters your soul, now you're in a state of true confidence or what he called in that message faith that everything is going to work exactly as you've now experienced it, because you've actually began to experience the truth in your life. So this is, a, this is a, the issue that we face often, is that we often hear these truths, they resonate with us while we're hearing them, but we fail to practice them in our day-to-day -day life, and so we'll never ever really believe them in our heart. They'll never change our soul unless we actually put them into practice. Does that make sense to everyone? And so you'll find in your day-to-day -day process, once you put these truths into practice in your life, you'll see your life begin changing. And as your life begins changing, you will be proven, it will be proven to you that it's all real. So that, that'll then make sense to you, wouldn't it? If, if, if it's all proven to you that it's real, now you'll have some really deep confidence in what's going on. And you'll have some really deep faith and you'll really feel it quite strongly. Does that make sense to everyone? Like, so that's something that, if you can practice that in your day-to-day -day life. So, for instance, um, you remember some time ago we had a discussion called Qualities of Truth. You remember that? And one of the things we said in the Qualities of Truth discussion was that um, truth is never afraid, or there's no fear in truth. Now, what I mean by that is that uh, if we're afraid, then we're already in error. So if you feel your fear in your day-to-day -day life, the key then is to actually say, all right, I'm feeling some fear, so I'm automatically in error. Now, what is the truth that I need to absorb in this situation? 
you know, and we, we can ask ourselves, and that can help us connect to the fear that we feel, release that fear, go even deeper into the beliefs that we have that the soul needs to release so that we no longer have that fear. And then the truth will be a part of our heart, not just a part of our head. So at the moment, for many of us, the truth is here, and we're pondering over it, and it's starting to bubble up in the soul, I suppose you could say, it's starting to affect the soul. The key is now for you to activate that process in a knowing way and really get started in making sure that truth now enters your heart. And you, the way that happens is by you actually putting it into practice in your daily life and seeing whether it's true or not. That's how it happens. And that's what we're basically suggesting to you to do. All right, now, I was just wondering whether there's any questions, further questions that you might have had for Mary, or that Mary wanted to maybe share a little bit more deeply about her personal experience? No? Then I'm happy to just sit there and let, let me have it. 
So when she got into you know saying I've done all this to her in the first century, I did that and I did this and I did that, I just sat there and just let her do that. And uh, because to me now she was actually connecting with the core emotion, not connecting to something that was a emotion of denial. So the key is to be sensitive with anger as to whether it's actually a core emotion like a childhood based rage or whether it's actually a, an emotion of an adult trying to get away from their core emotion. Once you're more sensitive to emotions, you can actually do that within yourself too. Yeah, so for you, Nina, um, with regard to the anger with your ex-partner, it's actually related to how you were treated as a child by a man. So the core emotion, it always gets back to this, as you know, your core emotion is actually about the, the you know, your ex-partner is treating your son, isn't it? in the same way as you were treated when you were little from a male. Uh, and there's a linkage there, and this is why you're getting angry with your ex-partner. The reason why you're getting angry with your ex-partner is because you're in the adult-like anger, wanting to blame your ex-partner for how he's treating his son. But actually, you, your son is attracting it because of your attraction, and your attraction was due to your first, to, to, to your first emotions when you were just recently born, right? So all of those emotions right at the early time of your life. And they are the emotions you need to focus on with men. So it gets back again to your relationship with dad or not having a relationship with dad and not being noticed and not you know not being cared for and those kind of emotions. Now you can feel that. Now that is actually going to also connect to the way you feel about God. So you're going to feel the masculine side of God is like that, is a person who doesn't care for women, doesn't care for me, you know, and all those kind of feelings too. So there'll be linkage of these feelings linked up which once you connect with it. So the event with your ex-partner, with the way he's treating the son, is actually just a trigger for the actual causal emotion which is related to your own child. Thank you. No worries. <laughs> now the dots are all connected, you just need to let the emotion go. Yeah. What I'm, what I'm finding, what I'm finding, and I think, it, I don't know if it's going to help anyone, but I usually come to your seminars in a really good space, feeling pretty great. And as I was driving here today, I'm thinking, here we go again. If I'm not going to connect to something here, the shit's going to hit the fan when I get home. <laughs> I appreciate it. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> Are there any other questions for Mary about how she's dealt with things? This is great, mate. <laughs> no, no, it's not that no one wants to know. I feel that lots of you are like, um, when I first started talking about myself, I got heaps of projections of anger and fear and terror and whatever, all this kind of stuff coming at me. And I'm just so impressed that you're not doing that with Mary. So <laughs> that's really good. <laughs> and there's a few good ones. Okay. Um, Mary, I just wanted to ask you um, um, what religion may have been brought up with, and if you do happen to see. Mary and Jesus and deities like uh, in the church, you see images and pictures. Um, is, what do you feel about that in terms of your, your existence today? I, um, I wasn't brought up in a church, and I wasn't baptized in school or anything. Um, I, my parents sort of had a fairly natural love philosophy, very spiritual, especially my father, um, but uh, sort of not in a religious sense. Uh, I have, I have within me that I've recently discovered a quite, one of quite strong feelings around organised religion, um, and I think that relates to the role of women. And the, you know, probably what a lot of the issues a lot of people have is organised religion, which is um, a lot of killing and uh, suffering has been done in the name of Jesus.
Jesus, for example. Um, so I don't, I've always actually quite enjoyed being in churches though, in my whole life. Yeah, because I like the idea of having a space where people commune for God. Yeah, I've always liked that. Even mosques, I, I've lived in the East for a few years and I quite like being in mosques as well. I wanted to know because um, I got caught up in the Da Vinci Code and often when I look at you I, I think about the Da Vinci Code and how much that relates and how much it does and that, you know the, 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 um, the trials that you went through as you escaped and your, your suffering and being hidden. I don't know if you know that or remember that. Mm. I wouldn't say that strong memories about that. Well, I have a lot of really deep emotions of a feeling of a time in my life after my husband died of being very afraid and a lot of terror and um, sort of I think I expressed a little bit yesterday about the loss of the, like the loss of a dream, the loss of something really magical for me and this feeling like I have to survive. Yeah, I guess I, um, I think it's not a sort of organised memory of you know, things that happened, but I have that very strong emotional experience. Um, I was laughing with AJ the other day because I, um, a little while ago, my favourite music was this Canadian rock by Goddess uh, Franco, and she's really articulate and poetic and She's really experimental and funky, and, and I used to listen to that. And I used to, you know, I used to go through lots of emotions, and, and like, it's a, it's a John Denver song. <laughs> <laughs> John, thank you. He's got this one song that it just takes me to that memory every time. Yeah. Not quite a cool image. <laughs> <laughs> Mary, it's really um, amazed me. You've um, been processing as this has been for about a year now, but your wisdom and your progression has been so rapid. Would this have come because of your previous work in the spirit world, especially in the celestial realms, or what do you feel? I mean, it's like, suddenly, you are Mary, who you know, all come to love. <coughs> you have so much wisdom and so much insight. What, what are your feelings about that compared to the rest of us clips? I'm <laughs> 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 sorry. <laughs> it's me. I don't think you were clips. <laughs> I, I actually don't feel very wise <laughs> at all. And I often marvel at some of you guys, you just processing a new clip. Strong connection with God, and, and mm -hmm. I don't um, thank you for your words. Yeah, I don't, I don't feel that You're a great inspiration. I mean, you think, wow, let's, let's get into it because you know, you, you, you just, you're just yourself and you blossom and you shine. And it's just um, a great inspiration. I need to say something. <laughs> <laughs> I, need, I need to say something about that. Um, Often myself and Mary have discussions that I would normally have with other people that I come away from knowing that they didn't get like one quarter of what I just talked to them about. Or oftentimes I have a discussion with people and I know I come away and I feel like yeah, there is a little bit of opening in their soul but, but uh, they didn't get any of what was just being discussed really and it will take some time before they do. And many have actually commented to me that they've heard something that we've discussed together and then maybe a year later they got it uh, and many of you probably have felt that over the last year even like six months later you got you really got it um, whereas what happens with my discussion with Mary is that she actually oftentimes finishes my words for me <laughs> during the discussion um, and one of the things that uh, is really obvious to me is how much it's in her soul and how much she's actually channeling her soul at times. 
without even realising that she is doing that. So, so what I'm observing Mary doing is that she's constantly questioning whether it's there or not within her, but when she's allowed to just let run free with it, it just comes out of her quite naturally. Um, and, and in a lot of ways, I wished I was like that at the beginning of my own progression as well, because it took a lot longer than, than that for me to do that. So yeah, it's something I feel quite strongly about, that Mary is, has the wisdom that's within her soul that I know is there, comes out of her quite a lot, uh, without her even being aware of that. Jodie, you have any questions? Discovering God and your connection with God, you will also discover what this unique thing is, this, this unique passion within you. And I'm not talking within just you, within both halves of you, but you and your soulmate, you'll discover what this unique thing is. And if you follow the pathway that, towards God, you will automatically grow in that passion and that desire and that unique thing will become something that will become renowned to every person who meets you. And in our case, the unique thing was this, that really strong, passionate desire for truth and for God. Um, and, and that's what I feel happened in terms of the soul, my soul, my longings, and I feel, and I can't, I won't speak from Mary on this, but her longings, but my longings are so passionately strong for God and for truth that, uh, that, that it meant that my longings matched God's desire for me. And what will happen in your life is that your longings towards a certain direction, whether it be music, art, animals, bird, creature, you know, it could be any area of life that you become passionate about, your longings will finish up matching God's longings for you. And that's when you will experience the most bliss in your own life. Does that sort of make sense, Jody, from my perspective now? In 
Yeah, I find it really confronting. Um, one of the biggest things that I went through when I first met AJ was saying, I don't want to be anybody special, and I don't want to be any certain one of any certain 14 people who um, who have this uh, job to do. And does that mean that it's somehow elite? And well, I don't want, I don't, I loathe anything like that, you know, on on the planet. Um, so it's, it's taken me a long time to sort of come to grips with that and I still don't, um, I still don't know that I, I feel I can be as capable as AJ at teaching this stuff. Um, but that said, it is my passion about it that has helped me overcome a great deal of fear to be sitting up here, you know, um, I do feel really passionate about it. And I can't see anything else on the planet at the moment that is actually going to help um, all of us to change. Hey Jay, within this uniqueness within each of us, is it in colours that you're with this whole way? Um, uh, the question was, uh, with the uniqueness that's within each of you, is it going to be enhanced when you're with your soulmate? And it's a really good question, actually. Yes, yeah. The truth is, yes, it's going to be enhanced when it's with your soulmate because the, it's the two whole sar, two halves of the soul that contain the same uh, uniqueness, if you like, on that one in that one passionate area. And so, so naturally, when two of you combine, the energy that's flowing between the two of you on this area is just just enhances each one's feelings about the process, if you like. So, so the more the more time Mary has spent with myself, the more her feelings and desires for truth enhance, and then the more they enhance, the more stronger I feel about truth and the same, about the same issue. If that makes sense. And, it's like a cycling of emotions that happens then between the two halves of the soul. And so as you grow towards God, that even grows even more powerfully. So if you imagine you've got this cycling of emotion going between yourself and your soulmate on a certain subject, and then this cycling is also going towards God and through the two halves as well, then you can start to imagine the power that it generates in your life. And so it becomes an all-consuming, burning passion within your life. And so yes, certainly meeting your soulmate can do that. Now obviously there's qualifications for that. And one of the qualifications would be that if you're, you and your soulmate are in very different degrees of soul condition, then obviously you're not going to be cycling the same kind of emotions quite yet until you are in the same similar or a similar soul condition. So initially it may even feel like total opposition so when I first met Mary, for example, the feeling that I got from her about me being Jesus was quite strongly negative. And, and because of that, it had a huge effect for me on the opposite direction. Of, so I went through quite a lot of emotions uh, working through that issue. Uh, and then as, as I worked through those emotions, and then Mary went through her emotions, now the link starts growing. And as the link starts growing, and obviously the desire for it starts growing and the longing grows as well. So as the truth, and it's like John's message that we just read, as the truth enters me and enters Mary, and then we're basically cycling the truth back and forth between ourselves, it obviously is going to just continually grow and grow and grow and grow. So, and I suppose it, it does relate to a lot to the quality of courage. Um, when you first meet your soulmate, you're going to find that you're probably going to be triggered quite a lot. And you're going to get to the point where you'll feel like, well, this is just way too much for me emotionally. The key is to have the courage to go into your own emotions constantly about that, rather than avoiding your own emotions about that. If you avoid your emotions, you're just going to avoid each other and therefore avoid this growing emotional experience. Remember this emotional experience is about you becoming more and more overwhelmed with emotion, not less overwhelmed. So the power of the emotion is going to overwhelm you more and more and more. And obviously what you're doing as your soul expands is you're coping with greater degrees of emotional expression. So as your soul expands, your soul's ability 
to expand its emotional expression grows. Now, obviously, when you meet a soulmate, if both of you are growing in that degree, then the ability to experience emotion between each other also grows in a, in a huge way. But also, the experience together, you form, in a way, I can feel, and, I, and you, Mary can probably accept a about this, but I can feel, in a way, myself merging with her. And as that merging process continues, um, I, I feel that our combined emotional experience just grows and it becomes more intense. And sometimes I know that is quite scary for Mary because she still has some emotions about wanting to be an individual, wanting to stay away from that. Whereas I have very little of those emotions left anymore. I feel that we are one individual, not that I am. I feel like I'm only a half of an individual, if that makes sense. Not in an incomplete way, but in the fact that the expression of our soul, if you like. And there's been some channeled messages about this recently uh, that some have, have received about how the two halves of the soul, when they meet, create really a third entity. And the third entity, obviously, is the combined soul, which has much more power than each half has, living separately. Mary does want to comment. <laughs> No, I still get challenged sometimes about um, uh, us becoming one entity because uh, I probably have still a lot of emotions of being very independent, very individual, and um, fear about total vulnerability with men um, because I have a fear of um, heart hurt to me. It's not related to AJ, it's just an injury, you know. I just have this feeling that if I expose myself and become completely vulnerable as a man, then I'm somehow open to harm um, towards me. Yeah, yeah, I think lots of us women have that. It's a kind of a, a multi-generational thing that, you know, um, a lot of stuff has happened. But I did have the realisation that while I hold on to it, it's actually, um, it's not going to help anything really. <laughs> I have to have the courage to step forward and, and sort of face that danger, the perceived danger. Otherwise, I'll always keep him at a distance. So it's a work in progress. Any other questions? Is there a mic that we could... Yeah, oh, you could probably hear me anyway. I can, but nobody else can. Oh, <laughs> um, this is a question for both of you, uh, for many particularly for Mary. I just wanted to, uh, and forgive me if you've answered this question already, uh, and that is that you had previous relationships with me in this lifetime, mm -hmm. and you have two AJ, so women. And um, I just want to, if you could just articulate a little bit about the differences that you feel with AJ now and, and compared to the other relationships that you had. Um, sorry. Uh, sorry. I, um, yeah, I've had two other major relationships. based it was, you know, what we were getting from each other and why I felt such a strong attraction and a lot of it was based on injury. This feeling of um, I want to be in control of my life and so uh, I attracted men who were very comfortable with me doing that and they didn't necessarily want to open completely and that seemed to suit me quite well as well. <laughs> yeah. Not to say that I didn't love those men because I feel that I did, but the difference with AJ is phenomenal for me. Um, I still feel completely overwhelmed to be with a man who loves me so completely and uh, wants to know about every part of me and share every experience with me. 
uh, and the difference in feeling which, uh, feeling someone who really does love and care from a place not of need or not a desire of something in return is something that I don't know that I've ever experienced and it was just such a gift. Yeah, and I feel quite unworthy of him at times. <laughs> have a lot of stuff going on. Yeah. And for me, it's like, um, in, in the relationships I've had, which has been two, two primary ones again, uh, I was uh, always searching for something really a lot deeper than what we had. So I had some very deep feelings of dissatisfaction with those relationships because I wanted a much deeper relationship. And looking back on it now, I can see that that was because I just knew what a relationship should be and, uh, and just felt that that wasn't possible. And there was a, quite a lot of dishonesty uh, in my relationships uh, in, the, in what was coming at me uh, as well, which obviously didn't resonate very much with me at the truth thing that's in, like, inside of myself. So, so uh, when I met Mary, I could feel like I felt straight away who she was, but I also could feel her grief and, and the other emotions that were there that had caused her previous attractions. And by that stage, I had worked through a, a very large amount of my injuries. I had far more injuries than what Mary had, has ever had this life. And so, if I didn't spend four or five years working my way through them, uh, I doubt whether I would have attracted her into my life uh, anyway. But once I had done that, yeah, the feeling that I have with Mary is just this really deep intimacy, uh, which is always based on truth. So we can be totally comfortable with each other saying absolutely everything, right down to the things I've been recommending that you talk about with your partner, even if, you know, if you're attracted to other people and all those kind of things. We can talk about all of those kind of issues as well and work through them emotionally. So there's a real deep bond and, and trust that happens between the two of us as a result of that. And also my feelings for Mary are one of, like, uh, as she's described I suppose, is this deep love for her no matter what she chooses to do. And, and so, uh, and I can feel that she has that love for me growing as well. And obviously as that love grows, and the bond between us just grows much more stronger each day as well. And as long as we both focus on dealing with the emotions that are harming that bond, and then I, I just feel like, and I know in my heart that the bond will just keep growing forever in its intensity. Um, and that also reflect, is reflected in our physical life together, our sexual life together, and and uh, just our mo the emotions that we feel for each other, and even our passions and desires, you know, unbeknown to both of us, we have very similar passions and desires right down to the food we eat and all sorts of things, and that that um, we didn't know, but you know, well, obviously I never thought that would be the case myself when I met before I met her, but it's just turned out to be the case as well. And that doesn't mean that it will be for everyone, but it's just the way it's turned out for us. And, and so there's just this really, really strong uh, bond, which is totally different than the previous relationship. The previous relationship felt a very surface layer, and I was always dissatisfied with that. And, um, and because of my dissatisfaction with it, and not dealing with my own emotions about it, the women I was with often felt like I would, they could never love me how I wanted to be loved. Uh, and whereas I feel strongly uh, that the kind of love Mary wants and the kind of love I want are uh, identical in nature. Yeah. Can I just add that the previous relationships I had had, I said um, that I had created these relationships where I didn't have to be fully vulnerable and I could be in control. I actually had a very strong feeling about how I wanted a relationship to be. And I, did, I was saying to myself, I want complete vulnerability, I want to be able to share all these experiences you know, us to share goal and vision together. But my law of attraction was telling me that I really, you know, I didn't want that because that wasn't what was coming in and that wasn't what I created. So 
that's sort of what I mean by the last year has been deconstructing what I thought I was going for and looking at it quite honestly about what are some, what are the different attractions and ways to end. Well, 
However, that all being said, my feelings are quite strong that um, that nothing will happen to myself or to Mary. Uh, and, uh, and while I can't ever be certain of that, uh, because obviously there are lots of different factors involved in predicting that, um, I feel that it is quite, I feel quite strongly that it is God's desire that these truths are demonstrated in the experience by someone actually experiencing them on earth, just as I felt on earth in the first century that it was God's desire for me to be at one with him in order to demonstrate the truth that that is available to every person on earth and in the spirit world. So I just feel quite strongly that these truths are all going to be taught, whether I'm the person who teaches them or one of the others of the 14 of the people that teach them. And I, I can't be certain. And I don't even know whether, in fact, you, one of you might be the person who teaches them if something does happen that, uh, that where, where I, for some reason, don't follow the path and my law of attraction changes. But the, the risk of something happening to me is very dependent on two factors. One factor is me um, denying my own soul. As soon as you get into a state of denying your own soul, you can set up a heap of events from that moment onwards that cause the law of attraction to keep into operation in order for you to actually start accepting your soul. So if I chose to deny my soul, in other words, I started drinking and smoking and doing all those things that I, we've talked about that you might do in denial of the soul. And obviously, if I start denying my soul, things would happen quite rapidly to me that would correct that, 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 that disharmony with love. The second thing that happens is that, is that obviously if I don't have a desire to do it. So if I don't deny my own soul but I have no longing to connect to God, then obviously my connection with God won't be good because I'm still under the same laws that you're under. And when I, once I pass in the spirit world, I might be triggered and remember some of the things that, I, that, that, that caused me to open that back up again. But my passion and feelings, as you know, are quite strong about connecting with God and never shutting down my own soul. So I can't really see those things ever occur. But some of the others of the 14 are shutting down themselves at different times and because of that are experiencing some very negative laws of attraction. And in fact, John, the Apostle John's passing was, was one of those events. When the, he desired to shut down his own soul, and within a month and a quarter he was dead. So he died from being murdered. So uh, those events can happen very rapidly, particularly for one of the 14, if they choose to deny their own soul. In the spirit world, at what um, sphere, how far can you go in the spirit world without having your, your soul mate with you? And at what point did you guys do you leave? At what level did you get to go in the spirit world? And you can progress to what I would call now the 21st sphere on earth without your soul mate. The chances of you being there without your soul mate to that point are pretty remote because by that point, you have such soul power and love that your soulmate is just going to be drawn from anywhere on the globe to you. So it's very highly unlikely you'd be without a soulmate at that point. But you can progress until the 21st year, until the pre-soul union state, if you like, without your soulmate in your life. And in terms of when we, uh, how we progress together, um, Obviously, in the first century, I was at one with God while I was on earth, and I passed, I, I feel I passed into the 10th sphere of the spirit world. So the 11th sphere upwards didn't exist at that point. So those dimensions weren't existing dimensions until I passed into them. Um, when Mary passed, I feel fairly sure that she was in a fifth sphere condition, but still working through some first sphere emotions at times. So she was rapidly in the fifth sphere, and then progress quite rapidly after that because um, her soul desire for truth was also strong. Um, in terms of recognising the possibility of reincarnating though, it took some time I believe for us to recognise the possibility of being able to have, perform a soul union. So theoretically we believed it was possible but because we hadn't experienced it we couldn't say for certain that it was possible. 
and was only in the 1900, the, the uh, uh, early 20th century, that we began to realise that that was certainly a possibility uh, that we could personally experience. And so that I have some feelings about working through that issue together so that we can actually get into that condition. Mary has not had those feelings. come up and 
and you will want to flee it uh, unless you want to actually focus on yourself and your own in your, in your own development. So what you, will, what you will need to do in each case is actually really focus on what's going on inside of yourself rather than blaming the other person for what's going inside, on inside of you. And but the amazing thing for me is, is that God stepped, has stepped in as a real force yeah. that for the desire of my heart, even though I didn't really know that that's what I was really desiring, yeah. to stay and to learn love and to learn the lessons and deal with the emotions and to love them. There are some emotions I believe that you will not be able to deal with without meeting someone. And that's why in the spirit world, the majority of spirits finish up meeting their soulmate in the fourth or fifth sphere of the spirit world. And uh, because they, they are not yet completed in love, but it's the soulmate relationship that helps them complete their love either in the natural love setting or in the divine love setting. And that's not always true for the spirits on the divine love path. But it's certainly true for the spirits on the death of the love path. And God has been telling me that that soulmate union is possible on this earth. So, Over and over, He's been telling me clearly that I can be up yeah. without denying that yeah. what you've been talking about, soulmate union, is really possible on the earth in the flesh, yeah. which is just an amazing and marvelous revelation in itself. Yeah, that is very true. Thank you. Any other questions? Justin's become the microphone, right? Thank you, Justin. Um, I just wanted to quickly ask while we're there, is that then the same with just forgetting about the whole soulmate thing for a minute? Is that with every relationship that we have? Like, do we just process our emotions and just keep doing that? You know, because I'm yeah. trying to forget about the whole soulmate. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Ye
and so, you know, if you can't speak and live in truth, then, then you're going to have a lot of difficulties with relationships. The other thing about truth is that, um, like, there's so much help available to us from our guides and from God, but unless we're in truth, they can't act because we're not in harmony, you know, with divine love. So that was a really important thing for me to learn, and it gives me strength when I'm feeling afraid of being in complete truth and vulnerability. Like, yeah. So, so do you understand, like, in your current relationship? The answer is to really focus on all of these lessons that you're learning about love and put them into practice without fear. And and you might say to this, I have people often say to me, oh, but if I do that, we'll be broken up in six months or we'll be broken up in two weeks. And I say, well, fair enough. If that's, if that's what's going to happen from you being truthful, then obviously there's a problem with this relationship. And now, most of the time, though, what actually happens is our partner is attracted to the truth. And what we think is going to finish up breaking us up often draws us closer together. And so there's nothing uh, like you just have the courage to, to live these personal lessons of truth in your own life. You have the courage to do it in your relationship, no matter how scary it gets or appears to be before you do it. And if you do that, you're, you will grow and there's a very good chance your partner will grow and even if your partner is not your soulmate, you will at some point both recognise that to be the case. And in fact, in the spirit world, this happens quite often where, where couples separate. So all the way through the spirit world, the first, second, third sphere, third, fourth sphere, fifth sphere, are still a couple, and then they get to the fifth sphere and they realise hey, they're not actually soulmates. Right? And they break up amicably and they're still great friends and they find their soulmate and have a relationship with their soulmate. And there's nothing to stop us from doing that on earth either. Every, every, every relationship breakup doesn't have to be traumatic. It's only traumatic if one party is not living in, in love. Then it may become traumatic uh, for that one party. And if both parties are not living in love, it's going to be traumatic for both. But uh, just let, let yourself live the lessons in love. Practice them in, in, in their life and the best if you're in a relationship, that's a fantastic way to start practicing these these lessons of truth and love. And Mary has some really, uh, I find quite emotional things that she's written down about different memories that she's had. And uh, I was going to ask her whether she'd be comfortable maybe reading one of those out or so. Some of them relate to children, which may. Um, trigger some of you ladies who have uh, who've had miscarriages or uh, who have lost children in some way. Um, some of them relate to other issues, but if she can pick one out that she's comfortable with, then maybe read one. Just to give you a bit of an idea of uh, the kinds of emotions uh, and maybe explain a bit of background about how it's going down. <coughs> Even now, I can't bear to consider your fate. 
I pray that you can hear me, hear my remorse, my shame, that I could be such a failure as your mother. I pray to God that you have found peace quickly, that you didn't feel my absence as a lack of love for you. Words can hardly describe my pain, the pain I felt at your passing. I missed you and felt that the rejection you must have felt to have been unbearable. I never wanted you to feel the pain of rejection that I myself had experienced. I loved you truly and in a way I had never experienced in my life before. I pray that you can feel my love and sorrow I don't know if I can ask you to possibly forgive me. I feel I have committed the worst crime a person can commit to of course the death of my baby. You are a beautiful, innocent creature. I did not feel worthy of your love. And yet I loved you more than I can express. Please know that I wanted to reach you and was prevented and every moment was panic and pain and dread thinking of you alone and helpless. I feel you must never want to know me again, but I pray my message and my love can somehow reach you. My regret overwhelms me. I'm so sorry, precious one. And what happened to Mary was that um, she was raped when she was four years in the, spirit, in the first century and there was a series of events even before then but this rape resulted in her pregnancy and um, and her family kicked her out of their house they, uh, because she was pregnant and she she then gave birth to, the, to her son uh, his name is Benjamin And she, um, because she was a single mother and pregnant, and only, sorry, single single mother and 15 years of age, in Israel at that time, the pregnancy meant that you had obviously committed adultery, it was the way that they saw it. Or, and so it was something that was life threatening. If you had a baby at that age, you, there was a high likelihood you'd be slain to death. So in order to care for her baby, she had to, to get food. She had to hide her baby to go and get food and then come back and pick up the baby. And uh, one of those times she couldn't come back to her baby and her baby died. And that's one of the experiences that she had in the first century. Which is that feeling that many of you mothers have, isn't it? Of worry about what's going to happen to your children. And that perhaps if something bad's happened to them, that it must have been your fault. So that's a very dominant emotion in many mothers. So. Thanks for sharing that. Mm. Um, with the 14, these emotions are like, they're not like pictures, you know, you hear a lot in New Age philosophy that memories of, you know, of past lives are just like pictures that empty. Um, and that's not how it is uh, for people that have been reincarnated. For people who have been reincarnated, the, they are just a whole series of emotional memories that after you have the emotions, then the pictures often come after that. And so. So that's why a lot of this stuff, when we're processing it, is very intensely emotional. And for Mary, this feeling 
when she had it was like it happened the day before, like that event happened the day before. And that's the very same, very much the same with some of your emotions you'll find, is that you, if you process some emotions that are about events in your childhood that are distressing, you'll actually find that it's like it's just happened yesterday when you access that emotion. And the key is to not be afraid of that, but actually allow that experience. Um, is there any other questions that you would like to ask Mary at all at this point? What we'll do now, I feel, is we'll get back onto that discussion of lessons in love. Um, perhaps though we might have a break before we begin it. So does that sound alright for everyone? It's only about quarter past two. So, so maybe if we can be back by about quarter to three, something like that. And uh, we'll talk about that. I know many of you are having a bit of trouble with this, right? Some of you are having some trouble with this? Because remember when I asked that question, some of you said yes, some of you said no, so obviously there's some disharmony in there, right? The thing to understand, and I'll get to you in a minute, Jen. the thing to understand is that as you're progressing, you are progressing in love, are you not? So that means there's more love in you, doesn't it? Than you had before. That You understand that? Now if you're progressing in divine love, that means that there's more divine love within you than you had before. Doesn't that make sense? So are you more loved now than you were two weeks ago? Yep. Yes, you are more loved now if you've allowed yourself to receive more love. You are more loved now. It doesn't mean that from God's perspective that he doesn't want to love you more, because he does. He wants to love all of us the same amount. But he can't give his love to you. It cannot enter you unless you are open to receiving it to that amount. Yeah. Can you see the difference? Yes. Okay. So, when I'm in the sixth sphere, I am more loved by God in the sixth sphere than I am when I'm in the first sphere, in the sense that I have received more of God's love, more of God's love passes through me than it would have if I was in the first, in the first sphere. I am not, I'm not in a state where I'm better than anyone, I have just had the desire to receive the love more than the other person has the desire to receive it. That's all. And so, you receive love from God proportionate to your desire. And by the way, this also occurs in a relationship. In a relationship, you receive love from your partner in proportion.